Well, I trust that you're having a great day, and I hope that everything has gone well today. And I trust that you are still enjoying this Bible study where we are today in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Uh, many of you are uh, faithful followers, and, and you know uh, that I've repeated um, intentionally that uh, we have to understand the, the origin of this letter, and so I trust you never get tired of me sharing that so that the first-time listener or somebody that's not been with us for a while understands <clears throat> certain core things that helps anybody uh, in their own personal devotion or Bible study. I mean, we're so blessed today, aren't we? So many different uh, avenues to do Bible study. Uh, we all have our favorite authors. We have our favorite versions of the Bible. We have certain commentaries. Uh, I'm still a book guy, and that's what I grew up with. Uh, I do access um, the digital a little bit, but for some of you, you live out there in the digital. So whatever source you have, uh, I trust that it is a good, sound Bible study uh, and a good, sound commentary. So, again, back to something that may help the novice or the uh, brand new uh, individual just starting on, I want to know the Bible. You know, just simple things of uh, who wrote this. And to whom was it written? And why did they write it? Just simple questions like that. But it also helps us uh, to get into the psyche or the mindset of the culture of that present time. Obviously, some things uh, do not carry over well after these many centuries. And other things, it's just like it was written yesterday about our present culture. Because that typically is talking about people and their nature. But when it comes to, you know, certain words in a Bible study that we've lost or through translation uh, has been demeaned, a, a good example is for most of us, we don't even have a garden any longer. We go to a grocery store. We may go to a market and pick up fresh produce but we didn't plant the seed in the ground and we didn't till the, the soil and <clears throat> we didn't get out and water it when we didn't get rain and we didn't go out and fertilize it. We didn't uh, get the weeds out. And so a lot of the language, uh, of course, uh, from the uh, Old Testament as well as New Testament was agricultural. Uh, and so you kind of have to get in that mindset when it comes to shepherding the same thing. Most of us, we may have a pet in the house, um, but there are a few that were raised somewhere around a ranch or a farm or some uh, preserve or something, uh, or maybe it's just an interest of yours and you study it. So again, it helps us to ask those um, constant, simple questions. And from there, you can build on it and get into word studies. You can get into um, studying personalities. Uh, isn't it amazing when we learn a little bit about psychology or psychiatry or both? And it's like, wow, I think I understand Paul better now. I think I understand Jeremiah a little better. I think I understand John because we can see traits of personality profiling that we understand today because we talk so much about it. And uh, I trust that helps us in that every author uh, that we find in the Word of God was human beings. In other words, they weren't perfected. Uh, they all had their own personal battles and struggles. Some of them uh, severely were depressed, and wouldn't you be if you went through what they went through? Uh, some of it was genetic. With all that being said, today, uh, as we get into chapter 16, we're going to talk a little bit more about some historical that may not just flow out as being super spiritual, but I, I do trust that even though today will be a little different than other previous times together, uh, that it, it will provoke thought for each one of us. So let's begin 
chapter 16 and read the first five verses. So Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. Of course, you need to underline that, circle that. <laughs> but this is the introduction. Notice again, a disciple was there, already a believer, already a student, but he's just meeting him. He named Timothy the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Uh-oh, okay, here we go. Verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. I, I, I got to say this. You don't think that's a big deal today? But back then, it was a deal. Kind of like, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, vaccinations? <laughs> and the polarization of that word today, vaccinations have been around a long time, but this particular vaccination with the political climate we're dealing with, with the health awareness that we have today, um, wow, it, it can cause great disruption. I, I'm not speaking on that. I'm just trying to make this come alive to what these people were dealing with again. So again, notice <clears throat> verse 3, that Paul wanted Timothy to, to go with him, but in order for him to go with him, he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them uh, <clears throat> for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So here again is Timothy just being introduced to us. And and I, I know that probably the majority, if not all, that are with us with Midweek with Manna, our students of the Bible at some level, we know the name Timothy. We've got his own uh, books here written, uh, of course, to him, letters that were written to him, but his name uh, will go on forever uh, because of the renown that he received because of this relationship that we're just now finding out about. Um, just uh, an FYI, and that is that um, it's been five years since Paul was uh, here in Lystra and Derby. And remember what we've studied in just the last couple times together, the, uh, the ups and downs, the roller coaster experiences, some incredible, wonderful things happening. And then, of course, making enemies along the way, and now the enemies are uh, following and going in immediately and trying to undo the work that it has been accomplished that's positive. So again, um, Timothy becomes this um, extremely important person to Paul. <clears throat> and look at the matrix here. Look at the setup that we have that again, the Word of God doesn't hide from us. And again, this letter in original form is written on papyrus. And again, you know, I'm not just going to put in there, oh, and today I went down to the mailbox and put in a couple letters, and then I read half a book. It's not the simple things that, uh, uh, that we're talking about here. As Luke is writing this letter to Theophilus, these are things you need to know about how Christianity got its start and its continued progress. And again, we know, as I've shared multiple times, and we'll continue through the study of Acts, we're talking about a 30-year window of time that, again, think about today, uh, the culture that we're dealing with. And there's an element out there called cancel culture. Uh, and we see this attack on... Um, disrupting any understanding of history. Uh, and to those of you that are following that and still haven't got uh, a pulse on, 
on the spirit driving that. It's, it's this mindset that I don't want to deal with the past. The past has blemishes. It has warts and wrinkles. We don't want to drag any of that and disease or pollute where we're going because we're going to utopia, which of course is not a real place. But it, I'll, I'll give it this much. We talk about heaven, going to a place where there is no sorrow, no pain, and uh, no sickness, no death. So there is that something in all of us that says, I, I want to believe I'm, and here's another word today, evolving. I trust I'm going toward a better place. Maybe that will help us relax enough to try to get an understanding of the times that we're dealing with. Uh, again, we see here that the Word of God is not hiding the struggle of the history. And again, now just to reinforce my comments that I've just given, we can't ever afford to lose our history. Yeah, there's always going to be warts and wrinkles and blemishes in the past. What we have to uh, also embrace is the question, has there been progress made? And of course, that's the thing that, that helps us say, okay, look what we've gained till now. Let's trust that we can continue to get better, uh, to love one another, to live in harmony with one another. So again, the Bible's not hiding any of these things. Let's go on now to verse uh, 6 through 10. Um, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. There are several things right there in that part of this letter that we need to make sure we don't miss. Again, we have just read that Timothy has been circumcised because of the audience that they're going to. Again, it is Paul, Peter comes along, others, wrestling with this thing called circumcision, and Jerusalem Council headquarters, the flagship church in Jerusalem, led by none other than James, the brother of Jesus, has said, okay, we're not going to put this yoke around Gentiles and have them be circumcised. Well, then what did we just read? Timothy is willing to get circumcised. He's an adult now. It's not an easy thing because of the audiences they were going to. I can remember as a teenager, and our youth choir had become a ministry, and we were traveling in the tri-state area, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, uh, primarily. We'd come to the south in the summer. And I can remember one night our leader, Terry, uh, uh, turned to the girls and said, before we go in the church building, you girls need to take your, all your jewelry off and, and tone down your makeup. And I'm Mr. Black and White at age 16, 17, whatever. And I'm thinking... I, uh, I don't even, uh, uh, no, sir, this is who we are. We're going to be there wherever we go. <laughs> My position was good for some places, but it wasn't good in that place. Terry, of course, was much wiser than I was at that time because he understood the audience that we were going into. Paul said, I become all things to all men, where by all means... How willing are we to be vulnerable? How willing are we to say, you know what, it's not for the rest of my life, but I'm, I'm going to give this up right now because my major goal was to reach that person, to influence that person. This is good, folks. I mean, I'm telling you, this is a good study today. Do we care enough about our neighbor? Do we care enough to be willing to sacrifice? Oh, there's a big word. So 
Timothy, of course, has a Jewish mother who is Messianic now. We're going to keep using that term, uh, a believer. And, uh, but dad's a Greek. And so, therefore, he didn't, uh, he wasn't circumcised as a child because, again, the, in those days, that culture, the father's religion or position uh, carried the day. So now here, Paul is instructing. We see that Timothy doesn't fight him, that he's willing to do it. Now, <laughs> here they are planning this trip, and they're going to go into Asia. And again, notice how it's worded here. Uh, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So he hadn't had this vision of this man from Macedonia yet. And again, let's just take a pause for a moment. How do we do at a time like this? I mean, do we have a good vibe about it, or do we get all upset real quick? Ah, I planned on doing it. Now, i got to tell you my nature. I'm a planner. Uh, I understand logistics. I understand time management. And I try my best to plan my day out. And I've come a long way, folks. Because there was a time I would write down my day. And if I didn't, if I had 13 things listed and I got 12 of them accomplished, I had a bad day because I had planned on doing 13 things. Or if I had put them in, in order because I had, even at a young age, I was learning time management before we even used that expression. And I was going to be on this part of the county and then over here. It bothered me if I, well, I don't have time to get this and I'll try to get back to it. They're stopped. And who stops them? The Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord stops them. How did he know? We don't know. Was it a feeling? Was it a moment in prayer? Was it another vision that's not listed? I'm always saying that to come back. Let's, let's have a good Bible, okay? <laughs> Let's let's talk about how does God speak to you? I know how he speaks to me most of the time. I've had those other times that were unique, and I'm like, was that really you? And so whatever it was, he's content that we're not going there. This this was my plan. This this was this was what I'd mapped out, and now we're not going. And then on the heels of that, having this vision and immediately being obedient to it as they're getting ready to go into uh, Macedonia. And uh, uh, so you got to ask yourself, you know, what, what, what caused that? I got to throw in one more thing that it may mean nothing. There's, there's two things about the language here. One is, We've talked about Alexandrian Troas, and we've talked about Philippi, and we've talked about Thessalonica. Those are all names. Again, you've, you've learned me. I, I want to know why we say what we say. I want to know origins. Do you know all those names are related to Alexander the Great? So again, we see that Alexander conquered the then-known world. Of course, he died uh, in his early 30s. And so uh, Alexandria Troas was named after him. Philippi was named after his father. And Thessalonica was named after his half-sister. Sometimes it's important to understand our surroundings. How did, how did we get here? And again, for the missionary, and I trust any of us see ourselves as missionaries anymore. How am I going to open up conversation? You know, I'm always talking about this in, in different angles. If we're going to win the lost, the Bible talks about that we got to be wise to win the lost. And if the gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are lost. They don't know they're lost. So how do I get an audience? How do I become an influencer? That's a word today. Uh, so... Sometimes it helps to understand, how did they get here? How did they get here? All these things are leading back, of course, to that. There's one more thing that we want to bring out here. The language, the verbiage also changed. 
because Luke is writing it, right? Notice what has happened here. And when they came to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of the Lord would not let them, and they went down to Troas. And then he talks about Paul's, and look now, verse 10, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. <laughs> How many noticed that? Most theologians believe this is where Luke now, of course, changes the language because he's on this trip. He no longer is writing about what he has studied, what's been passed down to him. He now is experiencing this. Isn't that cool? Isn't that way cool? All right, all right. Let's keep moving on. So now we're um, at verse 11, and we're going to read through verse 15. So, setting sail for Troas, we made a direct voyage to Sumathrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. Oh, let's see, he's dead which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. I, I got to pause there. It is a Roman colony, but did you hear all the Greek names? <laughs> I told you you'd love this study because we can parallel to today. I, I can tell you Grace Life Church, we're not who we once were. 105 years ago when the church was just struggling to see if they could be a church, when it built its first building on Ayers Avenue in the 40s and built its well-known building on Austin Avenue in the 50s, and bought property here on All Good Road in the late 60s and started building by the early 70s. And here, uh, you'll see this in Scripture multiple times, but remember this. We talk about world empires that Daniel saw in a vision, right? We know about Egypt. We know about Assyria. We know about Babylon. And we come along, and then there is uh, uh, the Greek, Greece, and then we go into Rome. And Rome conquered Greece, or did they? And as it's been brought out, the Greek had the longest lasting effect upon the planet. It Hellenized the world. And a lot of our thinking today goes back to, to Greek influences. Now, a lot of architecture still bears not only Grecian, but Roman. And we know a lot of our uh, interstate travel and and uh, grid works goes back to, to the Romans. Um, with all that being said, I thought that was worth bringing out again. Look at where they're going, but it's a Roman colony. So how are we going to communicate to a world that was conquered by the Greeks, but now the Romans are controlling it? You know there was some struggle there. So we remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went uh, outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. And uh, she was from the city of Thyatira. Again, the half-sister. Uh, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So again, a lot of, a lot of good stuff here. Again, uh, advancing the gospel as we're reading it and looking through this lens that had a 30-year scope on it. Uh, uh, most of the places that Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, their travels, they were going into uh, a, a Jewish hub, and therefore they always made it their attempt to start in the synagogue and stay there as long as they could. 
but in most places there was a shift, there was a rip. Here, they are now definitely extremely missional, definitely getting into the Gentile world. And as they do, here they come here, there's no synagogue. So where did Paul go? Again, probably Luke's with him and Timothy's there. They went down to the river because that had become known as where people would go um, to show respect, whatever God that they were reaching out to. And he goes there, and again, he shares the gospel of Lord Jesus and finds, among other people, this woman by the name of Lydia, who in today's world would be known as a fashionista, and she has influence. And you can, I mean, this is a strong lady. She gets, she becomes a believer. So she was a worshiper of God, but it's like, I'm doing the best I can. And now we've got the name of Jesus. Now we have the sacrifice. It makes sense to me. And uh, her whole household gets saved because of her influence. Uh, again, uh, we're just seeing this thing un unroll and, and progress. Again, just trying to get uh, an understanding of it. This, uh, for you ladies, you might really like this. And that is being the fashionista. She was a seller of purple. Um, ladies, aren't you so glad that you can either just go to a store or get go to Amazon and order it online if you like the purple? Uh, but back then, quite the effort. And that dye came from shellfish. And quite uh, an exasperating effort to squeeze that shellfish and just get a drop at a time uh, to create this dye. But can you imagine in a black and white world? It's just like a Wizard of Oz, right? We used to watch it once a year, and we remember Dorothy in that little farmhouse and and and, and uh, survives the crash. And as she opens that door, it went from black and white to living color. <laughs> so here's this purple. It's like, wow, I got I to gotta have that. Uh, so Lydia was quite, uh, quite the entrepreneur. Let's go on now, and uh, we're going to read uh, quite a bit to close out. Verse uh, 16 through 24 now. So we've just been introduced to Lydia, but verse 16, and as we were going to the place of prayer, again, no synagogue, we were met uh, by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by her fortune telling. She was actually known as a pythro. And um, so she followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God. She wasn't lying, was she? Who proclaimed to know the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become, <laughs> I love it, greatly annoyed, ticked off, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour, that very hour. Power. But when her owner saw that uh, their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing the city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Again, because of our time, let's go on reading uh, the rest of the chapter. Because we, we've So we've met Lydia. So you're seeing... Uh, the, the spectrum, she is, she is of the elite, of, of aristocrat-type uh, society. She is wealthy. We now see the poorest of the poor, this slave girl uh, who obviously is uh, demonized, and uh, others are making money on her as if today we still deal with this thing called prostitution and the abuse that goes on, human trafficking. It's really a form of human trafficking, isn't it? Verse 25, we're meeting yet another significant individual who falls in the middle class, a civil servant, 
Uh, and about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, fell down before Paul and Silas. And when he brought them out, said, sirs, Oh, man, the emotion of this, the passion is, what must I do to be saved? Oh, I trust we see this in our culture today. If we're willing to pay the price, verse 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that was in his house. And he took them the same hour in the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them up into his house and set food before him. He rejoiced along with his entire household. He believed in God. But in his day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come now and go in peace. Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are, get ready for it, Roman Citizens, oh my God, we thought they were just Jews and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. And the police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. A lot of reading there at the end, just watching the time. We could have broke down more of that, but we had already studied, of course, the letter to the Philippians in a previous study. You can, it's archived, you wanna go back through that. But here's the foundation of the letter that inspired, uh, or what inspired the letter excuse, to the Philippians that we have in our Bible. It, it started here. A church was formed in Philippi. Again, hear that Greek name, but a Roman colony at that time. And look at the, uh, the makeup now of Paul and Timothy as they go into a world that didn't know about them. They were already getting renown over here, but now they're going over into Macedonia getting into Europe, felt they were going into Asia. And now we see them uh, strictly seen as speaking something totally foreign. And yet there are signs, there are wonders, there's wonderful things going on. There are people who have been trying to reach out. There has to be a living God. And of course, um, these people opposed, I, I, we want no part of them, and they're trying to come in and change our ways. And so they pay the price. Once again, even Timothy now, who has the Greek father, but now has been circumcised, traveling with Paul, seen as strictly just Jews, they had no idea they were Roman citizens. That was actually by law, forbidden, unlawful, with the penalty of death. Here it is, the magistrates that have ordered this beating, and yet in reality, their own law condemned them, and they should have been put to death. And so when the jailer, and again, the wonderful transformation there, and again, the bravery of these disciples and and not suing everybody and not just going out on social media and ranting and raving. Oh, excuse me, I, I digress. <laughs> but here they are, they knew they had an audience. And they've been set free, miraculously. The magistrates just want them out of there. Don't disrupt our world. 
Paul, no, I have no part of that. They have beaten us, and we, we didn't do anything to deserve it. We're Roman citizens, and can you imagine how that reverberated back? They just knew they were in a world of hurt. And here they are, of course, uh, bold enough to go back <coughs> to state a position. I want to conclude with this. The reason I went through that a little faster, again, because we have the study we've already done. We have a fashionista, a slave girl in human trafficking, and now a middle-class civil servant, jailer, all reached by the gospel in different ways. I want to bring out the point of how spiritual this remains. I had this conversation yesterday with another bus driver, and we were talking about the times, and we are just talking about this and that and the other. And as political as things are, I made the statement, I said, now you, you, you know, you and I are getting pretty close. You know that I'm a pastor. So please don't just take me as being preachy, and I didn't get enough preaching time last Sunday behind the pulpit. What we're dealing with is extremely spiritual. And this driver, I know is churched, but you don't ever hear this thing of, there's passion in this person about it. And they just pause. I said, see, you can't, you can't miss that. The Bible tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of wickedness in high places. There are principal spirits given assignment to bring disruption to a region. Here we see a slave girl who was empowered demonically and through her uh, pythro evidences, you and I would say fortune teller and giving people this word of, of knowledge and wisdom. Again, listen how spiritual all that is. Not Holy Spirit, but spiritual. And as she is delivered, all that went with her. You know, she just set free. There was a change in her life. I want to tell you that we can never, ever, ever forget how spiritual this thing is. We can go to church on Sunday, and it looks like it's pretty much what we expected from the last Sunday, from the Sunday before that. There's certain songs. There's going to be preaching. There might be how spiritual every time we gather and every day. I'll conclude with this. Several years ago here at the Marietta Church of God, as I was youth pastor, my father-in-law, of course, Walter Langdon, had scheduled a man to come preach who was from South Africa, Brother Moodley. And he was responsible for several churches, uh, the Elam churches that were uh, looking into coming into the denomination of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. And so he was here stateside. Well, they got mixed up, and he was in a motel on the south side of Atlanta, Riverdale. And, of course, here we are on the north side, Marietta. So my father-in-law said, you're going to have to go get him during the Sunday school time. And I, I didn't even get the man into the doors until church had been going 30 minutes. And he literally walked in the building, went right to the pulpit, started preaching. In that conversation coming up the road, I got to talk to him about something just like this. And I'm, I'm going to make it real quick. But I said, do you believe in demon possession? And <laughs> he just looked at me like I had three heads. Don't you? I said, do you believe that Christians can be tormented by demons? Don't you? I went through a litany of questions, five or six, and he just kept back with us. Don't you? Don't you? Finally, I said, you have to understand the culture that we're in. We say we believe it, but we don't really believe it. how spiritual this thing is. We get so caught up in the circumstance, so caught up in the personality, so caught up in the trend, so caught up, so caught up, so caught up. I remember him telling me, he said, well, I still pastor a church as well as overseer of these 60 other churches. And he said, in my church, two, 
two weeks before I left to come here to the States, he said, I, uh, we, I preached and we had people come to the altar and we prayed for a woman to receive the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost and she was speaking in tongues. We were happy. He said, the following week, we cast three demons out of her. I said, did you say what I think you just said? Are you telling me? He said, yes, exactly. What had happened the week before was very demonic, hard to detect. We definitely saw a breakthrough the following week. You got to understand Satan will come as an angel of light. You got to understand he'll come as a destroyer. Come at multiple different ways and just know that he is as a roaring lion, seeking to do what? To destroy. To destroy. Let's conclude with a high note. He may be as a roaring lion, but we know the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's just mimicking what God has already established. So as we have a stopping point in our study today, seeing what was going on there, we parallel so many things to today, right? Let's be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We thank you, our Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the study that reminds us of not only what you've done, but what you're doing now and what you want to continue to do. And yes, we have these people that are immortalized in our mind now, but our time is right now. It's, it's all we've got. We won't get a second life upon the planet. Help us to be obedient to your voice now, sensitive to your spirit, and let's also be effective in this hour and share the good news and be a continuum of what we witnessed here the first 30 years of this thing called Christianity. We bless your holy name in the name of Jesus, we pray. Until next time, keep a good vibe.